start the recording. All right, so let me start off uh, by mentioning the, um, uh, well, kind of reminding you what the issue was uh, last class. When we first started our scene here, if you remember, we had our guy right here in the middle of the screen. And the experience we were having is as the uh, scene was loading, when we got to the, the second scene, he was actually colliding with that middle collider box. What we were attempting to do is as the scene was loading, we were deciding, should he stay here in the center or should he get repositioned you know, by one of the exits? Well, what was happening is, is that when the scene first loaded, before we moved him, or even as we were moving him, he was, since he did technically start here in the middle, we um, were having an interaction with the collision box here, and he was triggering it, which would then effectively make him collide with middle, which would then trigger the code, which told him to stop moving. Um even though we were, you know, as part of that, he did finish his trans, uh, uh, you know, the, the move to his position to the new location. So we were confused as to why is he hitting this, uh, this middle when he's actually over here. And the reality is it has to do with how the scene is loaded. Now, we did introduce this idea, and I'll go ahead and put it in the notes. We introduced the idea, um, so I'm going to call it a happy accident because it was something we were going to introduce anyways. So let's just assume I did it on purpose. <laughs> um, so we have these things called coroutines. So a coroutine is like a thread in Java or other languages. where we can have some code occur. Now, up to this point, we were always looking at it in a, in a non-blocking way. And that's where things get a little bit weird with uh, Unity. Since Unity is already a heavily multi-threaded application, uh, meaning that we uh, there's lots of things kind of happening at the, let's call it the same time. We're still at the mercy of what does the same time mean, and that's ultimately what this all related to. Um, but things are already happening at the same time, like the update method gets called every single frame. The uh, If you do, uh, uh, there's a couple of other update uh, functions. There's even a late update that gets called at a different point in time. So there are a bunch of things that are kind of all competing with each other for CPU time. And especially when we consider that we have multi-core processors today, where the uh, processor itself uh, can handle multiple things at once, it's entirely possible for more things at once to, more, thing, more than one thing to happen at the same time. All right. So we can think of these coroutines as kind of like a thread where they allow us to do something in a non-blocking way. Um, we're gonna say, but in Unity, many things do not block. So by us moving our, um, by us, well, here, let me show you back in the code here. I think that'll be the easier way of explaining this. So if I, I've made some modifications to my code and it is up on uh, GitHub. So for example, this code right here, where we change the position of our uh, transform, this does not block. The math of this happens instantaneously. So this dot game object dot transform dot position is a vector three variable. We are setting that vector three variable equal to this new vector three value. There is a difference between what its value is and when it actually updates on the screen. 
When it updates on the screen is going to be something related to what's happening inside of the game engine itself for when it decides it's going to move stuff around, whose turn is it to move, things like that. All right, so us, what we did last time was we put this guy inside of a coroutine. If you remember, we started this coroutine down here to get the ball rolling with this. And then what we said, so this was our function for our coroutine. You can kind of think of this like the run function for threads in Java. What we did is we just arbitrarily said, let's wait for a second. All right, and I mentioned at the end of class last time, this would be pretty bad programming practice. And I uh, gave you an example. Actually, I was thinking I was in the middle of the example and then we ran out of time. But when I was a kid, there was a, a game called Double Dragon. Uh, that was in the arcade. So it was like a big deal when it finally came to the personal computer. So we had it for a really, really, really old computer. And um, well, it was a new computer back then, but by our standards, it was an ancient computer and it ran just fine. Well, when I got a newer computer, again, an ancient computer by today's standards, but it was much, much, much faster than that old one. Um, what ended up happening is the game ran so quickly, it was unplayable. All the bosses and stuff came out basically instantaneously, all this uh, all this stuff. Uh, and it was because the way, oh, I got somebody's in the waiting room here. There we go. And it was because the way that they handled delays, the way that they handled the time between um, when, uh, you know, when the, the level started and when the boss comes out, they did with these things called busy wait loops. So they just basically sat there and experimented with it and said, okay, well, if we run this loop a million times, that would take about eight seconds, you know, whatever, something like that. Well, when you run that same program on a much faster computer, eight seconds turns into a quarter of a second, something like that. So the game was unplayable. So the lesson from that, so keep in mind, these are professional developers doing that back then. So, you know, uh, this is kind of where we have to start thinking about best practices um, in coding. So the issue here is, is that what we did last time to effectively, let's say, get it working was we started off this uh, thread, this coroutine, yet we, oh, I close my, yet we told it to wait for a second. And the idea was that one second was just enough time for it to get out of the way from the middle and get relocated into the a different part of the scene. Now, that is by no means a guarantee. So I mentioned it would be very bad programming practice to, to uh, effectively get your code balanced in such a way that it happens to work based on timings. All right, so we wanna find a, a workaround for this. Now, one thing I did mention at the beginning of the class that is kind of the starting point for a trustworthy solution, and I've already done it in my code here, is you see I've moved my uh, player outside of the scene. You can move them kind of wherever you want. And then what we do is when the uh, scene first, well, outside of the visible part of the scene, and then when the scene first starts, we then position him where we want him. All right, that way he's not accidentally hitting any sort of colliders. All right, so now I would say that it is probably reasonable programming practice, especially in a situation like this where we're working with colliders in different places, to use this as a good rule of thumb um, so that you don't have accidental collisions. Because we can always just position our guys at the beginning of the scene, and from a human being's perspective, it's going to seem like our guy was at the center of the scene right at the beginning. So if I go ahead and hit play here, from our perspective, he started in the middle, all right? Because the code behind positioned him there, all right? So let me go through that uh, that code a little bit. Um, first of all, before I do that, I added something to our notes here. So, and this is actually a, a common programming uh, concept. It's something that we run into. Uh, it's something that we run into in... Um, uh, mobile application development. So if you're doing iPhone development or Android development, there are points of time during the life cycle of a screen. In this case, it's the life cycle of a scene where you have opportunities to interject logic. 
All right, so up to this point, we've been using this function called start. All right, now notice here that this method is called right before the very first frame of update. Okay, um, and it's only called if the uh, script is enabled, which means that the game object that it's attached to is also enabled. All right, probably not a huge deal most of the time, uh, but could be a deal breaker as opposed to this function called awake, that happens regardless of whether the game object the script is attached to um, is activated or not. Another time we can interject is when something turns from enable from deactivated to activated. So when we make something activated, the object uh, will call this function. And it'll call this function every single time you enable uh, this script. So if you have a game object that turns on and turns off, so if you think back to your rollerball, um, when we had those guys that we collected, when we collected something, we didn't remove it from the scene, we just disabled it. Well, if for whatever reason, let's say we have a timer where, you know, if you don't collect all the uh, stuff in a, in the, a shorter enough ma uh, period of time, the things start popping back on the screen. If we re-enable one of those things, its scripts would call its on enable again. So if there was anything you ever wanted to happen at the moment that a game object becomes enabled, when it's moving from disabled to enabled, you would put it inside of this function called on enable. If there's something that you want to have happen, regardless of whether a, um, uh, a game object is active or not, maybe it's initializing some variables, whatever it is, you can put it inside of this function called awake. Now, for all intents and purposes, for a, a game object that is already active on the scene, you can probably look at awake and start as very, very, very similar. Technically, awake would be getting called first. All right, so this method is called when the script instance is being loaded. So this is before it started, it's being loaded. Uh, and it's used to initialize any variables or game state before the game actually starts. Awake is called only once during the lifetime of the script instance, okay? Um, so this guy gets called exactly one time, just like start gets called exactly one time. Um, uh, let's see. And notice here though, that start will only get called if the game object is currently enabled, where awake gets called regardless, all right? Now notice that it says start, is called after all awake methods have been called. So this is a place you can set up references between scripts, yada, yada, yada. But all these things still rely on timing. So for example, in my code here, can I not tab between stuff? So in my code here, notice that I've currently changed this. Well, I had it at, I have it at start. I can switch it to awake that did not actually solve our problem. So even though I was having it technically occur before start, because Unity is multi-threaded, things are not necessarily happening in a guaranteed non-blocking way. So bottom line is anything that's happening inside of start, for example, if we change the position of something, this sets a variable to a value. It does not necessarily mean the actual game object has relocated. He hasn't necessarily moved yet because the game object has, or the game engine hasn't made him move. So that's where you can start running into some issues. And the solution to that is not to um, uh, put pauses and stuff like that in there, unless that is like the only solution for something. And it's a trustworthy delay. In this case, we're trying to just time it between the time that uh, the game starts and the time that our guy gets moved. All right, so a good rule of thumb solution here would be for us to uh, just position our guys off the screen and then put them where they need to go. So let me show you how I accomplish that. So you can leave it at start. You can turn it to awake. It really doesn't matter in this particular case. And you can also ignore this rigid body thing. Um, that was when I was kind of debugging it because there are some alternative ways to move things. So instead of changing its position, you could tell the rigid body to just move to a different, uh, to move to a position. 
um, which is governed by its own thread. But in the end, it actually did not make the situation any better. Um, I would just call it equivalent. Um, but so what I do now is when the game starts, just like last time, we turn off all the exits. All right. So we don't want to accidentally have our player, if he were to uh, change his location to an exit, we don't want to accidentally have him trigger that uh, uh, that exit and load the screen again. All right. We want to have these guys do the right thing initially. So I turn off all the exits. If you remember, we wrote these two functions, turn off exits, turn on exits. All right. Now I'll mention ahead of time, there are some situations here where I actually probably do something somewhat redundantly to kind of um, emphasize the uh, um, the logic that we're going through here. And this is one of those examples. So if you remember up top here, um, we have our middle of the room and out here in our code, Middle of the room, well, actually, he's re-enabled now. So last time we were turning off the middle of the room by default. So now I leave it enabled here, but I programmatically turn it off. All right, so the very first thing we do is we turn off all the exits and we also turn off the middle of the room. So effectively, none of our colliders are alive at the moment. Okay. Now, as far as I can tell, these things happen effectively atomically. It's not reliant on a value changing and something happening on the screen from a physics perspective or from a location perspective. All right, so we can rely on these guys happening instantaneously and not necessarily uh, running into issues with other things. All right, so I have every, all our colliders turned off effectively. Then I ask the question, this is effectively saying, is this our first time loading this scene or are we already heading in a direction? So we get into this if statement, the first part of this if statement, if we are already heading in a direction, that is the current direction is something other than question mark. And if you remember in our singleton, current direction starts off as question mark. All right, so when we first launch the game, it's a question mark. So if we're not the very first thing, what are we gonna do? we are going to make sure our am moving is sent, set to true. This is a variable we use that, that we can ask, is my guy currently supposed to be moving? Now, this is actually redundant because if he were moving, we set that someplace else. But this is kind of a, so let's say I'm being slightly inefficient here by setting something that's already true to true again. But I would look at this as kind of reminding ourselves that, we are currently in motion and that um, um, and we're kind of trading off this reminder uh, for the slight extra amount of time it takes to update that variable. Once you get comfortable enough with it, you could just comment it out, something like that, and you wouldn't see it. All right, so we're gonna initially say we are in motion. All right, we're gonna turn on the middle of the room we're gonna say we're not currently at the middle of the room because we're presumably gonna be at one of our exits moving towards the middle of the room. So this is kind of setting up the state of the scene for what things are true right now. We're supposed to be moving, we're heading towards the middle of the room, so we want that collider on and we're not there yet. Okay, now we ask the question, where were we coming into the scene from so that we can position our dude in the right direction and look at the opposite direction. So if the direction we were heading is to the north, we'll position our guy to the south, but make sure he's looking at the north. That way he's facing where he just came from, something something like that. So this gets him facing the right uh, direction and, and that kind of stuff. All right, but again, remember that these things right here at least this first thing, they both probably they both kind of behave the same way. This is updating the value of a variable, but the value of that variable gets read from some other part of the game engine that actually makes this line of code true, that actually transports our game engine to a, or game object to a new place. All right, so we cannot rely on this line of code. After line 57, we can't rely on our actual game object instantaneously being at that new location we've just staged the value that will be read to determine where he should be. 
All right. So this is kind of going to be at, in competition with other things that are running in our program, which is kind of where our entire problem came from. All right. So depending on the direction we're currently heading, whether it's north, south, west or east, we make sure we set our guy by the rate exit and make sure he's looking at the correct place as he's coming into the room. That's what we do initially if we were already this is not the first time we're in the scene. We got to this version of the scene because we already hit an exit. Otherwise, if this is the very first time we're in the scene, we don't want to uh, uh, put him by one of the exits. So instead, we're going to say we are not moving. We are at the middle of the room. We'll go ahead and turn off the middle of the room collider because we don't want to accidentally collide with the middle of the room. Uh, because that we're currently using the middle of the room collider to make our guys stop moving. As we come into the room, we want him to stop at roughly the middle of the room. But the very first time the scene loads, we want him, we don't want him in having any interaction with that middle collider. And then we're going to go ahead and place our game object at the middle of the room. So this line of code, the very first thing that happens when we launch our game, this ultimately positions him from here to the middle of the room, which allows us to then see him positioned at the middle of the room when the game starts. Okay. So inside of start, we are programmatically setting up this state. And we either position him by an exit facing in the correct way, or we position him in the center. Um, and we also turn on the variables like am moving, am at middle of the room, that kind of stuff. All right. Now, assuming this is not our first time into the scene, we would be by one of the exits and as long as we are not moving, we'll listen for one of our keys. So let's say we want to head to the north. We press the up arrow. We're going to go ahead and then say, okay, we're going to start moving. We are going to turn on our exits because we want to be able to deal with the collider of whatever hit we hit for the exit we run through. We're going to set the current direction that we're heading. This is just information that we're setting in our singleton. So if I press up, we're going to be heading north, and we're going to make sure we look in that direction as well. That way our guy faces the exit that we intend to move towards. Okay, But the kicker here is, is that by setting am moving to true, we make it an impossibility for us to get into any of these other if statements, this particular load of the scene. Because these if statements can only be true if this is true and we are currently not moving. So as soon as I say I am moving, it no longer will respond to our arrow, arrow keys for this particular run until am moving gets set back to true. Uh, actually, it would already be true. Like I said, this would be in a redundant uh, move. Right here, we turn it back to false. That would be only the first load of the scene. All right. So as soon as we turn it to uh, uh, to true here, these guys won't get triggered. All right. So then we'll turn on our exits. We'll bump into it. We'll set all these other variables. So that this code up here is responding to our arrow presses. Down here is where we make our player actually begin moving. And this is that move towards thing where we update Every single time through our players, uh, every time through updates, we update the player's position to a spot just a little bit closer to where we're moving towards. All right. So if we've set our current direction up here to north, this guy is going to keep nudging to the north. And he's going to keep doing that every single frame until we finally collide with the collider in the north. Because we will not get into any of these if statements up here again because we have set am moving to true so this will be false every single time and anything and false will be false all right so we'll keep moving towards that moving towards that moving towards that eventually we bump into one of the exits because we had turned the exits on all right so as soon as we start heading north, for example, we flip the exits on and we mark ourselves as moving. So when those exits are on, that means, and this is just the exits, not the middle of the room. When those exits are on, that means we can collide with them. 
which means that on our trigger enter, we had all our print statements from last time. We'll ask the question, is the thing we just slammed into a door? If it is, we'll go ahead and load a print out that we're loading a scene and we will load another version of this screen. So we're loading our dungeon room. Um, okay. Um, the other thing we can collide with is the middle of the room, but we can only collide with that if that's enabled. So on and so forth. All right. So this was all debugging stuff we put in there to find out why are we hitting all these extra things. All right, so if I'm in the middle of the room and I start heading north, we've turned the exits on. The thing I can collide with is a door. And if I hit a door, I'm going to go ahead and load the scene. When we load the scene, we get a brand new version of this script, which calls its start function, which turns off all the exits in preparation for us to position our player wherever that player is going to be positioned. Either he's by one of the exits or he's going to be at the middle of the room, depending if this is the first time we're running this or not. We'll set the middle of the room to false, so it's inactive. So basically all of our colliders are turned off at the very beginning of start, and then we'll turn them on as necessary. We ask the question, are we currently heading in a direction? The answer is yes, we are. So we'll set ourselves as moving. We'll turn middle of the room on, but we have not turned our exits back on. We'll say that we are not at the middle of the room yet, because presumably we're moving towards that. And then we start heading, depending on the direction we were heading, we position ourselves at the opposite exit and then look at the exit that we went through before. So he's facing the correct direction. Okay, so this is our cadence. So... When we write it this way, we now get something that's not based on a timer. So very first time through, he gets positioned at the middle of the room. The middle collider is turned off. We programmatically turned it off. All right. As soon as I hit one of the arrows, I'll go ahead and hit the up arrow. As a response to that, it's going to turn the exits on because I'm heading towards an exit. And he comes into the room, and when he hits the center, he stops. If I go to the left, he heads that way, comes in the room. If I go north, he heads that way. South, heads that way, so on and so forth. All right, so we're playing this game of turning colliders on and off and making sure that our player kind of starts before we see anything off the scene, and then we bring it in and position it in the right place. This isn't based on any sort of timing. And also keep in mind that our code says that once we've started moving in a direction, so if I hit left and then I change my mind instantly and try to go up, I'm already moving, so I am not going to be allowed to get into those if statements. If my guy is already in motion, my guy is already in motion here, I cannot get into this if statement. So I cannot change my direction once I've started heading in a direction. So if I head west and then change my mind to north, I'm pressing the north button over and over again. Finally, it was able to do it because I hit the middle of the room. Okay, But this allows me to go in one direction at a time. Okay, so a couple of new things we've kind of learned as part of this. We haven't necessarily run into a situation where we've seen an appropriate use of a coroutine. We'll eventually get into something like that, but at least we've been introduced to effectively the concept of a thread uh, that we control. So a coroutine is an extra thread other than the update and the, uh, um, the fixed update. And there's actually a late update as well that is kind of like the last time things get called after a per frame basis. So you can kind of put things in those different categories to get the behavior that you want. Okay, so... Based on all of that, are there any questions of, uh, of kind of what was going wrong last time and how this is the fix? Let's start with that before we move on to the next stuff. Okay. Let me just check chat real quick and make sure that's uh, nobody saying anything. Okay, so we're good. All right, so what do we want to have happen next? So right now we have the ability for our guy to basically drive between rooms, you know, and we just keep loading the same scene over and over again. 
All right. Now, I had mentioned that we might want to have kind of a dungeon that gets randomly generated. Okay. I think I had mentioned that if you uh, are a gamer, you may have previously heard things like things that get uh, procedurally generated. Um, uh, so a lot of video games, they say they're procedurally generated. So things that things when something's procedurally generated, that means they're doing it in code. All right. So our current game, what it does is just keeps loading scenes every single time we go between these rooms, but we're not keeping track of how many rooms we've created. So as I drive through here, uh, I don't even remember how many rooms I'm, maybe I'm on the fifth or sixth scene that I've loaded. All right. We are in no way keeping track of that information behind the scenes. All right. Because for instance, let's assume that this is just the beginning of the game here. And let's assume that I have randomly generated whether or not we have all four exits available to us or not. And let's assume that I can't go to the West if we have the West exit closed up. That means if I hit the left arrow here, I would not be able to go to the West. Right now we can go in all directions and we don't have any way of closing down an exit. But if we assume that we randomly generate this room where certain exits are available. Maybe we have to make sure we always have at least one exit. Um, and we only allow our guy to move in the direction of an available exit. We want to then record that room somewhere. So that if I, let's assume I can move west here. So I move west. When I get into this room, at the very least, I can randomly generate my exits. But at the very least, the exit to the east must be there. Because I came into this room from the exit to the east. That means I have to be able to go back to my original room here. So what we're doing right now is we have our interface. This kind of comes down to maybe like a model view controller type thing. Our interface is updating. But the code behind our logic isn't keeping track of how many rooms we've created. So we want to start thinking about that. So let's look at that initially. What do I keep clicking on? I can't hit tab to move it. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to go into my singleton. Uh, well, actually, before we go into our singleton, we need to write another script. So I'm going to go out to my scripts. And just like we created a script for player, I'm going to go ahead and create a script for room. I don't know why I thought it needed to be all caps, but. Okay. And then I'll go ahead and open that guy inside of C Sharp. Now, very first thing here is room is something that we're going to be using to keep track of information about the rooms that have been created. So this guy is not a mono behavior. which means he doesn't get a start, he doesn't get an update. He is a plain Jane C-sharp class. All right, so for our room, uh, if we kind of mimic what we had before, maybe we say a room has a private string name. And we had talked about rooms having exits before as well, but we don't technically have that idea quite yet. So let's just start our room off as having a name, all right? So we'll go ahead and write our constructor for this guy. So we have a room, takes in a name. This dot name is equal to, oh, hold on. Uh, this is, a, we're going to say I did this on purpose. I kind of sort of did. Um, when I first created this script, if you remember, I had it in all caps. And then I renamed it. Well, when I did that, it renamed my script appropriately, but it did not change my class name to be the lowercase version. And remember, your class name must match the file name and your constructor matches the class name. All right. So kind of a you know note to self, if that ever happens to you, when you change something 
in here from a naming convention perspective. It'll change the name of the file, but it will not update any of your code inside of that file. All right. So now I've patched it up. Now it's in the condition it would have been in had I named my script correctly initially, had I not had it in all caps. Okay. So what I want to do now is every single time a room is created visually, I want to create an instance of a room here. Okay. Well, I want to create one of these guys. So we can say that who is controlling a room? Maybe at this point we can say, well, who knows about the rooms? Well, maybe the player keeps track of the room he's been for been in. Maybe we have an overarching uh, kind of guy who's in charge of the dungeon. So I'm going to actually do that. So I'm going to come out here and I'm going to close this thing. And we're going to create a empty game object. And we're going to call this guy the dungeon. The dungeon controller. Game object. All right. Notice by default, he's put in the center. In this case, we don't really care where he ends up because we're not going to be using him as any sort of game object that is interactable. He is just existing in an invisible state on the screen, and his main purpose is so that I can hang scripts on, scripts on him. Okay? So this guy is a game object, and which means that his uh, default level is just having a transform. All right. So now I'm going to create another script. And we're going to call this guy Dungeon Controller. And before I do anything else, I'll click on my Dungeon Controller game object. I'm going to add a script. And we're going to add the Dungeon Controller script to him. All right. So you can almost think of uh, this guy as this like overarching entity who can keep track of things that are happening in our scene, not specifically related to any individual game object. Um, almost like an orchestra conductor, if you will. Now, we could have put this stuff inside of Chomp, inside of our player, and just had him keep track of the rooms and stuff like that and update our singleton. Um, but it probably makes better programming practice for us to say things that go inside of the player are things that the player directly cares about, not necessarily the environment around him because he can ask the code about his environment. All right, so we created this empty game object. We hung a script on this. And then what we'll do is we'll go in and we're going to update our dungeon controller. This guy does need to be a mono behavior because he is attached to an actual game object. So we cannot change that. And what we're gonna do here is inside of this guy, we're going to create a room. So we're going to create a room R is equal to a new room. We'll just call it a room here. All right. So what did I do here? I created an instance of this normal C sharp class called room that takes a name as a parameter and just remembers what the name is. So he's not very, uh, um, capable at this point. And then what my dungeon controller did is for each scene, we have a dungeon controller and each dungeon controller has a dungeon controller script. So that script, when a scene is first created at this point is generating an instance of a room. And then what we want to do is we want to let our, um, uh, we want to let our uh, scene uh, know about uh, this the, this room, let's say. Uh, or our singleton, rather, know about this room. So inside of our singleton, we're going to need to keep track. Public static. Maybe call this guy a room array, initially. 
call this guy the rooms and we'll start them equal to a room array capable of holding a hundred rooms let's say all right so this is an array that holds a collection of rooms now the rooms dot oh am i not able to do it in here well we'll come back to it uh we'll i'll show it to you in a second let me come in here so I've added a static member to our singleton. So we would access him by saying my singleton dot the rooms. So if I come into my dungeon controller here and I say my singleton dot the rooms dot length. This is the number of elements inside of that uh, room array. So this will give me a value of 100 right now. So just as in Java, arrays in C sharp can report their length. Whereas if you remember, arrays in C++ could not report their length. So we had to keep track of um, how many elements were in there and pass that information around. Now, having said that, our logic here is a little bit quirky. And that is not that it's gonna remain this way forever, but right now I've built a container capable of holding 100 rooms. Currently there are zero rooms in there. I haven't actually put any rooms in there. So I really need to keep track of a separate variable. Static int, um, Let's call this guy uh, num rooms, and he would start off at zero, something like that. Okay, because right now, even though I can hold a hundred rooms, I currently have zero of them. So what we might have dungeon controller do is we might have him go ahead and set my singleton dot the rooms at bucket my singleton dot num rooms equal to the room we just created. And then maybe we say my singleton dot num rooms plus plus, because now we have one room in there. All right, so now we can do this in our script here, or we could add some functions to our singleton. So maybe in our singleton, I go ahead and I create a public static void add room this guy takes a room r as a parameter and maybe what i do is i go ahead and i say the rooms at bucket num rooms is equal to r and then num rooms plus plus and by doing that I can now replace those lines with a call to my add room function and just pass it my room. So we have taught our singleton how to add a room in there. Now, as we currently have this written and to kind of go along our lesson of when we consider public private protected, that variables should be as, um, uh, private as possible, we're going to go back into our singleton and we're going to say, you know what, at least at this point, I don't want my rooms array or my number of rooms to be externally changeable. So I'm going to make these guys both private. And what I'll do is I'll make my function add room, I'll make him public so I can externally access this guy. All right. And he can access these private members because private means that this variable is only accessible inside of the class name my singleton. And I am currently inside of that class my singleton right here. All right. So now, quick question Why? Could I not say this dot num rooms? 
Now, in the past, remember, I've kind of mentioned that I like putting the this keyword in front of these things to make it. It's actually a little bit quicker because you're not making it go and hunt for where the variable is. You're telling it where it can find it. And you also reduce your number of spelling errors because you let the command completion stuff run. But why is this dot num rooms here actually an error as evidenced by the uh, red squiggly? Anybody tell me why that guy's currently an uh, error? Because of static versus non-static? Correct. Yep. Static versus non-static. The this keyword only exists in non-static contexts. While we are inside of this function, we are inside something called a static context. And a static context would not have a variable named this. Now... What would be the equivalent, since I've said in the past that I like putting the this keyword in front again to reduce spelling errors and also make it a little bit quicker. What would be the equivalent in a static context of the this keyword that I could put in front of the rooms or num rooms? So instead of saying this, what could I put here? The rooms is a static member of the My Singleton class. How do we call static members? Using the name of the class in which it was defined. So I can say my singleton dot the rooms. My singleton dot num rooms. Now it's not required just as this dot is not required when we are inside of the class and we are inside of a non-static context, but I think it is better programming practice to put things like this in there. Um, it probably gave you some speed, although modern compilers are pretty good at streamlining your code. They make you look better than you are um, at coding. Um, but I think this really drives the point home, at least for you know, uh, relatively new, inexperienced programmers that drives the point home of what am I dealing with here? Am I dealing with a static context or a non-static context? Because that's, that's such an important piece of information. Okay, so for our homework for next class, we're going to take just a little, a little hop forward. And then we'll do something maybe bigger over the weekend. Okay, so homework... Modify your dungeon to have a room randomly generate the number of available exits to be something between one and four. Okay. Every room has to have at least one exit. All right. So then I'm going to say, only allow your player to move toward an exit that really exists. For non-exits, do something to visually make the exit non-available. Maybe you put a wall up instead of the archway, something like that. Submit a link to your GitHub repo and the self assessment. All right. So you're not actually going to have to use like our room objects and stuff like that quite yet. We're looking at just a visual representation along with the logic of when a, when a scene first loads, randomly generate between one and four exits and then make sure that only the doors that should exist exist and make sure your player can only go in those directions. That makes some sense. Questions, comments, concerns, bribes. Uh, Professor, I sent you a message on Slack. 
Okay. Good or bad one? Uh, it's a bit of like a <laughs> just a question on like the I guess I don't know how to put it. Like my only the only exit that works for me when the scene resets is the north exit, and I don't know. It's okay. I, think I explained it better on my Slack message. I- I got it. So I'll look at it. And then your, um, uh, is, is your code with that problem in it? Is that up to date on your Git repo? Uh, I'm actually going to update it right now. Okay. So do me a favor then and go back and just add to your, uh, Slack message, the link to your Git repo. And I'll look at it here in about 20 minutes or something like that. Okay. Thank you so much. Yep. All right. Any other questions? Lemon, why weren't you at the hackathon yesterday? Oh, I've been. You could imagine, as a department chair, I'm dealing with a lot of this budget crap. <laughs> we have a oh, sh- we have a lot of meetings uh, uh, looking at stuff. Um, the good news is all of our meetings are pretty positive in that they deal with how can computer science help other departments that are having trouble. So uh, we're coming up with creative solutions to that. But that was the main reason is. Uh, lots of meetings uh, these these next couple of weeks, and you know now I got to go over to uh, we're taking a trip to the synod at some point, so fun stuff. <laughs> Sounds boring. I hope you get to go to the next hackathon. It is boring. Trust me, it's boring. It was the hackathon? You should there? have you should have Simeon send you all the codes because I think me and Liam's game win. Oh, did, well, did they didn't judge? They just had everybody do it? Um, it it was only Simeon judging because we didn't have a professor, so he's going to get back to us as soon as he can. Okay. Um, well, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask Simeon to send me the stuff. Or maybe he has a repository somewhere. Unless, did you put it up on GitHub? Uh, yeah, I was about to because my GitHub wasn't working for some reason, but I figured it out. Okay, well, so if you get it up on GitHub, why don't you just email me your link and I'll go look at it. Okay, thank you. Have a good day, man. Yep, you guys take care. Have a good day, Professor. Yep, bye-bye. Well, so I'm moving my...